captured my heart with Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. You notable men of the foremost nation, to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Colin and look at it, for from there to Great Hamath, and then go down to Gath in Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The second reading is from 1 Timothy, chapter 3, page 1193 in the Pew Bible. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproachful, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be, a wor are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household hold well. Those who have served well gain in excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. The Gospel is from Luke chapter 16, page 1049 in the Pew Bible. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone goes from the goes from the dead but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead.
We're going to be in the book of uh, 1 Timothy, but let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word with the word of prayer. Lord Christ, what a glorious day to have life and breath, and we are grateful for these things. Thanks for your word, which is before us. Help us to put aside, by the power of your spirit, anything which would distract or hinder us from hearing your words this day. May then the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable and pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My wife works for Sign Fracture Care. They're right up uh, G-Way here, not too far from us. And uh, this week was their international conference. Their doctors from all over the world uh, come and, and spend a week here with Dr. Louis Zirkel, who started that um, company and ministry. And, and they provide uh, orthopedic uh, solutions that are um, non-electric, that can be done in any setting throughout the world uh, to set bones and you know fix people and all that kind of good stuff and so on wednesday um, jeanette and i were able to go to the red lion and have a nice meal there and uh, hear some of the doctors speak and these are our world renowned orthopedic surgeons the first one to speak was getla tesema he's a medical doctor in the country of ethiopia He's the head of the orthopedic department at Black Lion Hospital. And uh, Dr. Tessima has over 70 orthopedic residents that train under him. He was talking about Dr. Zirkel and this great ministry and, and how they've been able to help people in his country and internationally for many years now. And he said about Dr. Zirkel these words. He says, Dr. Liu's love for humankind is borderless. Wow. That's a pretty good review, don't you think? And I don't know about you who know Dr. Zirkel. He's been in the community for a long time. Or maybe you've heard of him, or maybe his reputation has preceded him. But that's not a surprising comment for those of us who know Liu that his love for humankind is borderless. He's a Christian man and acts out of his love for Christ and others and has really sacrificed and given his life to this company. And it reminded me, as I was preparing for this message and thinking through our text in 1 Timothy, about the importance of a good reputation. Paul writes to... Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor. Timothy is pastoring the church in Ephesus. So Ephesians is also written to Timothy and the church. Paul writes to this young pastor and he wants to talk to him and impress upon him and the church at Ephesus the importance of picking the right leaders in the church. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to 1 Timothy chapter 3. You can follow along in your bulletin or uh, knowing John, the text will be up here behind me. We'll see. You'll wait with bated breath and no, it's there. So Paul begins this teaching in verse 1 by saying, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. When it comes to leadership in the church, God smiles upon those who actually do this difficult work. It's a noble task because the one who serves is not only serving God, but also serving God's people, and maybe all the more serving the community and the society around us. And I've got to be honest with you, this is not an easy work. If Paul thought this was an easy work, he would have said to Timothy, this is a trustworthy saying. Leadership in the church is an easy work. But anybody who's served 
in the church knows that it's a difficult work. How many of you here have served on a church council, either here or someplace else? Raise your hands high so we can see them, and thank you for your work, because this is a noble task that you were called to and faithful in responding to. In the same way, deacons, those who serve in the, in the ministry of the church, this would be akin to those who are serving in area, any area of ministry, on a ministry team, part of worship, putting together bulletins. Deacons do the ministry and the work of the church. The, the overseers or the elders, we call them church council members here or, or even staff, those are the ones who oversee the whole of the ministry. But the deacons play a different role. And it's not hierarchical, by the way. It's just an equal but different role. Deacons are more active in the lives of the people and getting the stuff done on a day-to-day -day basis. So both of those are lifted up as a noble task. Both of those are lifted up as important positions in the church. And there must be some considerations when we're placing, or, or in our context, electing people to ministry. And so what are those? Well, first, Paul says, they must be above reproach. What does that mean? That means you can easily identify with the eye, the ear, knowing that faith and life, it's evidencing the conduct that's befitting a true follower of Jesus. And did you see or, or hear in these words that we're more focused on the being of the individual, not just the doing? Verse 2, Paul begins by saying, now the overseer is to be above reproach. But many times, even in the church, especially in the church, we choose people for leadership based on what they what? Do. And oftentimes it has nothing to do with spiritual things. We say about this person, well, they've made it over at Hanford. They're a great teacher in the schools. They're a great hospital administrator. They've climbed the corporate ladder. If they can do it there, they can do it here in the church. But that's not necessarily true. And so Paul doesn't hold up the, the doing of work, but the being of the individual. And then all of these characteristics that sets one apart as being above reproach have to do with character and integrity and the soul and the heart of the person. And so, to be clear, I want to make sure that we know we're not talking about being perfect. Because if we're to be perfect and in leadership, I would be the first one to step down. <laughs> Paul's not saying without defect or that you have to do these things perfectly. No, Paul wanted leaders in these positions in whom the Spirit was evidently and actively at work. Can you see the Holy Spirit working in this person? Not that they've finished or gotten there. Not at all. In fact, if somebody says to you, you know, my goal is to be like Jesus and I've finally gotten there. That person ought not be in leadership. <laughs> because we're never going to make it. But to strive with sincere hearts after the life Jesus lived, that's the important part. And so what are some of these characteristics here? Well, faithful to his wife. Some translations say the husband of one, of one wife. But the reality here is it, it, it means wife or faithful to a husband, faithful to a spouse. What that means is that we're, we're managing our marriage with God's help and by his grace. We're going to talk more about that and the importance of being managers of our own families first before we seek to lead in the church. Number two is to be temperate. Number three is, is uh, just like temperate, someone who is self-controlled. What does this mean? It's someone who's not easily angered. You ever work with a hothead? Don't raise your hands because I know you have. 
It's miserable. You ever work with somebody that they can go from zero to really, 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 really upset in seconds? Maybe not even a second? This is what it's talking about here. We need to be temperate and self-controlled. If you go from zero to really angry in a short amount of time, then maybe you need to step away or not take leadership position in the church. They need to be hospitable. What does that mean? Having others' best interests in mind. That's what somebody who is hospitable is. They, they want to take care of others. They put themselves in the back seat. They're able to teach. That simply means that they're, they're, they know the scriptures. They're not new in faith. We'll come, to this, we'll come back to this in a minute too. Not given to drunkenness. That means you have to, you have to keep your mind pure and, and safe. That they're not violent, but, ge uh, but gentle. Can you imagine violence in the church? May it never be, as Paul would say. But oftentimes we see it. Oftentimes leadership in the church looks no different than leadership out in the community. Shouldn't be that way. Number nine, not quarrelsome. Now, some have taken this to mean that we, we have to agree on everything, but that's not what Paul means here. Paul's allowing for difference. Paul is allowing for disagreement. In fact, those are healthy things in a leadership body. Nobody should always agree on the same things all the time. It's healthy to have some diversity. It's healthy to have disagreement. But don't get angry and upset in that disagreement and become quarrelsome. Have you worked with that person that always has to be right, no matter what? That's what this means. It's okay to disagree, and sometimes we need to agree to disagree, but there are people in this world that don't agree to disagree because you're wrong. <laughs> Paul says, don't raise those up into leadership. Number 10, not a lover of money. Doesn't mean you can't have money. We are all rich here in the United States. The top 1% of the world. No, it means that we are not to serve money. Remember last week we read the text that we can't serve both God and money? That's what Paul's getting at here. Must manage his own family well, or her own family. And so we may make it in the secular world. In fact, we may work out at the lab and become a vice president or wherever in our work. But what God is seeking is someone who's the vice president of their family. And men, that is the highest office you can attain in your family. Sorry. Vice president's pretty good though, right? The president's job is always taken. And so God's concerned first that the leader focus on their family. Isn't that interesting? Why do you think that's true? And, and Pastor Corey and I, we, we try to hold each other accountable in this area. It's true because the family is a microcosm of church. Your family is a microcosm of church. Because church is the body of Christ, and it's a family. And if we can't manage our little microcosm of church, then how in the world, I ask you, and so does Paul, are we to manage the family of God? You can't do it. And so for both Pastor Corey and I, we are committed to managing our families. And, and, and I, I don't really even like that word manage. It's, it's more like ministry. You know, my wife and my boys, they, they are the first ones that I disciple and pour my life into. Same for Pastor Corey. Number 12, must not be a recent convert, meaning they can't be immature in faith. They haven't been there, done that. And that's to protect them, that they aren't let off into sin. And then lastly, must also have a good reputation with outsiders. Those are those, are those folks who are outside the, the church, in the community. It'd be interesting to ask those who know leaders at our church, outside of our church setting and in the community, 
what kind of reputation this person has in the community. And then Paul shifts gears a little bit and talks about deacons. And he says, they are also to be worthy of respect and above reproach and worthy of respect are the same thing here, basically. To be above reproach means that someone can't say about you that that these things are untrue. And to be worthy of respect is the other side of that same coin. If we're above reproach, then we are worthy of respect. What does that mean? Paul kind of fleshes this out for us. First he says they must be sincere. And by the way, these things are, are, are observable in life and faith. We ought to be able to see these things happening, not perfectly, but we ought to be able to see these things happening in the life and the faith of the one who is leading. That they're committed to growing in Christ. That they're committed to living by the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Sincere means that they don't get it right every time. Sincere means that they may fail. They may make poor decisions. But the reality is that when they're sincere, they're trying their best. They're doing the best that they can. And, and what does that demand from the body of Christ? It demands that we give them grace and forgiveness if they mess up. You know, one of the things uh, churches are reticent to do when it comes to their leaders is to ascribe to their leaders proper and right motivation. Do Corey and I get it right every time? No way. We're, we fail a lot. But our hearts are sincere. I don't think anybody could question our hearts. Our motivation is pure. We love Jesus. We love his church. And that's why we do what we do. Same with our council members. And I've got to be honest with you. In the last few months, our council has been beat up. They've been worked over. We've made a few changes, good or bad or how, indifferent, however you feel about those. We've had people leave our church because we changed the time of a service and then ascribe to our leaders that they were uncharitable, unchristian, and unloving. Man, really? Is that, is that what we think of our leaders? Because friends, if so, they should be deposed. <laughs> but I would suggest to you that our leaders are sincere, that their motivation is pure. And even though we don't get it right every time, at least we're standing there in the gap. At least we're, we're surrendering and serving Christ Jesus. And so we continue, not indulging in much wine. It's interesting that these show up on the same list. It's really important, that means. Not pursuing dishonest gain. Number four, keeping hold of the deep truths of faith with a clear conscience. That, that means trusting and living by faith and not fear. A Christian leader has to have faith and not be afraid of the outcomes. Not, not, not to live a life that, that serves people, but to, to live a life that serves Jesus. Number five, they must be tested. This is a corollary to the encouragement of an overseer to not be a recent convert. We must be tested in our faith. A not a malicious talker. Let's use one word to sum that up. A malicious talker is a gossip. I tell you what, churches are rampant with gossip. And we need to be, we need to be raising up leaders that aren't prone to that, but that, that, are, that have courage to talk through the difficult things that are temperate. Again, this comes up, it's important. Trustworthy, faithful to, one, uh, to his wife, and managing their children well in their own household. Again, managing, ministering in the family is really important. Did you hear the promises here in this text? I love that Paul concludes with promises. Why? Because this is a noble task and it's a difficult task. Because 
the Christian leader in the church, Paul knows, is going to, to have a difficult go of it most of the time. But Paul wants to encourage that person. He wants him or her to serve with a generous, sincere, and loving heart in this call that has been given to them. There are two promises, in fact. The first one is found in verse, both, actually both are found in verse 13. Those who have served well, first promise, gain an excellent standing. What does that mean? It means they're worthy of respect. It means they're above reproach. It means they have been, they have been tested and been found true. True, not perfect, but true. And then number two, and more importantly, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. You know, in many ways, we serve those of us who serve in the church for one purpose and one alone. It's out of love for God's love for us and his grace and his mercy. And I can't wait. I, I, I hear it in my own mind every now and again, but I can't wait. And, and I hope those of you who have served and who are going to be serving or continue to serve also have this attitude about standing in front of Jesus. Do you ever think about this? Standing in front of Jesus and hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Not perfectly done, maybe not even done well, but Jesus will say to us, well done, because of our faithfulness. These are not suggestions of Paul's. These are not want-tos or should-dos. These are the must-bes of church leaders. And I simply want to close by encouraging you. Take a moment this week. Seek out or find a council member. Write him a note. Give him a phone call. And say thank you for your service. Because theirs is a noble task. Amen. You show your majesty in every star that shines and every time we breathe. Your glory, God, revealed from distant galaxies to here beneath our skin. You are higher than we ever could imagine. Closer than our eyes could ever see, you are magnificent. You alone are holy, no one else is glorious as you.